Okay, thank you very much for having me. Bonjour. Uh, this is a talk about where the industry is going in big data, which is more towards stream processing. Uh, it's kind of high level compared to what most of you are used to dealing with with Scala, but I want to come back to how it affects Scala and how Scala is kind of driving a lot of what's happening here. Uh, the pictures are all random pictures of water because we're talking about streaming. Uh, I, I, and I've taken all of them, I think, except maybe one. This is actually from a national park in the west of the U.S. called Glacier National Park, which all the glaciers are disappearing, unfortunately, but it's still called Glacier National Park. Um, and I, uh, basically, I, I run the team at Lightbend that's developing uh, what we call the Fast Data Platform, which is a uh, distribution of open source tools like Kafka and Spark and so forth. Uh, so we've been thinking a lot about what people need, uh, what they should use, and so forth. And so that'll be, kind of be what this is about. It's really a summary of uh, this report I wrote last year uh, about uh, sort of trends and architectures and so forth around these, these technologies. So let's kind of put this in context. You know, why did we get to the point of worrying about stream processing? Uh, if you've been in the big data world, um, how many of you have used Hadoop? I've actually worked with Hadoop. Okay, yeah, I can see the pain in your eyes. Uh, uh, so Hadoop is kind of the classic uh, definition in some ways of the big data architecture. Uh, very much oriented towards very low cost at very large scale, but also very large distributed uh, processing of data. Not terribly sophisticated dis distribution. It's more, you know, partition the data and, you know, process it in parallel. But it's kind of sets the stage for what's evolved since. This suddenly works. Actually, maybe this has stopped. All right, there we go. Um, so there, there, this is kind of a sketch of the architecture that you might have, and there's really three main components. Uh, the first is some sort of distributed storage. Hadoop, the Hadoop distributed file system is uh, uh, terrible, actually. It's uh, kind of a piece of crap, but it's what we live with. Uh, but it does give us this illusion of a one file system that's actually partitioned over you know, a big C of, of uh, hard drives across a cluster. Uh, then you need something that can actually compute over that, and that's uh, originally was this uh, API called MapReduce, uh, and is now typically done with Spark as a successor to MapReduce. The funny thing about MapReduce, those of us in Scala, uh, when you look at what it actually does, it really should be called flat MapReduce, because it's not actually a one-to-one -one mapping, it's usually like flat mapping, but you know, we didn't make up the name, I guess, so nobody asked us. And, uh, and then you need something that manages everything that's going on in the cluster, at least in theory. Uh, actually, what this uh, yet another resource negotiator, Yarn, does really is just manage Spark jobs. It doesn't even manage the file system and so forth. And then for completeness, I added this other bubble for uh, tools that were popular for getting data in and out of the cluster, uh, Flume and Scoop in particular. But that's, you know, the purpose isn't to talk about uh, Hadoop so much, but just to sort of set the stage for why streaming's important. So what, what were the big characteristics? Well, it was batch-oriented as opposed to stream processing. So you basically, it was designed to capture data and then let you do massive processing over it later on. Uh, you know, low cost of, of storage, uh, you know, effectively infinite scalability, or at least you know, infinite for some definition of infinite. Uh, and also supporting multi-user jobs. If you think about it, what, the, what I just described is really a database kind of ripped apart, where instead of it being a black box, you, you worry about how things are stored. You worry about writing applications that do the equivalent of SQL. And a popular use has been actually replacing big data warehouses uh, because the cost is so much cheaper. So, that's sort of where we started, but uh, there's this phrase that you probably have heard, uh, you know, time equals money. Uh, it's usually better if you can get answers faster. My favorite example of this actually is search engines, because if, um, if you think about how Google and its predecessors like AltaVista, anyone remember AltaVista? Uh, yeah, a few of you. Um, the, how do they work? Well, typically they had a web crawler that walked over the internet all the time and captured this data, which was nothing more than like a reference to a URL and then the content. And then sometime later they would do some processing over that data to build an index. 
Well, that worked pretty well for a long time as a batch mode process, but you know, today what happens when you hear about a breaking news story, you immediately Google information about it. So if, if Google is not gonna update their search index for another hour, then you're not gonna get any of the hits for like local news feeds or whatever that would tell you about this. So even something that you could do in batch, it's actually better to be doing it in, in, in real time uh, so that you're constantly updating your state of the world based on new information. Uh, the diagram is taken from the book, and the numbers, uh, bubbles correspond to uh, the book, so that it was easy to associate content in the book with um, uh, the, the diagram. But, so I'll, I'll ignore the numbers, but I'll just talk about the main pieces of this, and then we'll drill into the streaming engines part. So it starts with data coming in, and I basically broke up the sources of data into sort of three clumps. One would be like classic REST requests. They could be stateless. It could be asynchronous, but nonetheless, sort of a traditional way of interacting with services on the network. Not really the way you typically think of streaming data because usually there's, a little, there's too much overhead if you are working at high volume. If, if you happen to be ingesting the Twitter fire hose to do processing, you would not do it over REST, for example. Rather, you'd probably do it over some sort of just raw socket that's just, you know, you're sucking the data in, if you lose it, you, you lose it. You can't go back and get it that easily. Uh, so that's sort of what I meant by sockets. It's this stream of data coming in asynchronously that I may not be able to go back and retrieve later. Whereas I, I use the box uh, logs to sort of indicate data that might actually be internal, something I could go back and get. And I was thinking of like server logs that I might want to do operational analysis over, or even uh, business logic analysis over things like click streams. You know, how are people using my website, that kind of stuff. One of the things that I'll come back to a little bit later is that when you start building these streaming systems, it actually changes the nature of your architecture because now you, you have to build services that are uh, durable, scalable, reliable, all of the sort of illities that we talk about uh, that we're used to building for microservices. And at the same time, we often wrap business logic in microservices so that they're accessible from our stream processors. So I think that microservices now become a, a much more important part of these architectures than they were in, say, the Hadoop world. And of course, Lightbend sells stuff like that, but uh, you know, it could be anything that you like to use, Go-based, um, Node, et cetera. But of course, we'd all use Scala in this crowd. So. Uh, Zookeeper is here because a lot of services use Zookeeper to store like uh, you know, cluster-wide information to do federation of masters, that sort of thing. Kafka in particular uses Zookeeper. And Kafka is really the data backplane in this architecture. Now, now there's some interesting alternatives that are emerging, but most people are using Kafka as the glue between microservices and also the, the, the way to capture data reliably and, and basically in a very large buffer so that you can do queuing through the system without having to worry too much about uh, the kind of back pressure problems that you run into if everything is in memory, if you're just sending messages like over actors or whatever. So Kafka is uh, organized much like a message queue, although they describe it as more of a log-oriented uh, system. Um, yeah, it, but it's message queue-like in the sense that you, you read and write to, uh, for topics, and the topics can have an arbitrary number of readers and writers, uh, producers and consumers is the term. And then all the data is persisted to disk uh, so that you get some durability in case one of the processes goes down. Uh, Kafka is also nice as an architectural simplification uh, in the sense that, you know, I, I drew this ugly diagram of everything talking to everything else. I guess it's a fully bipartite graph. Uh, not only is this hard to reason about if you're the architect, but it's also fragile, right? So if service one crashes, then all of these direct links might result in data loss. And somehow I have to figure out how to tell uh, the services on the left, uh, here's the new service one, here's how to connect to it and all that. So I've got a, a degree of uh, fragility and potential data loss in my system. Whereas, as we know from computer science, we always solve every problem with another level of indirection, right? So here's how we use it here. Um, if we run everything through Kafka, then if service one crashes, the data is still reliably captured. The services on the left maybe don't even care that service one is down because they're still able to write and do their jobs, and then service one can then be restarted. Also, I get independent scalability more easily. I can, I can add 
instances to uh, you know, uh, handle extra load and so forth. Um, the, the other thing that's kind of nice about this approach is that it's, it makes it, uh, it means there's one API for everybody to use. So instead of, if I'm doing direct service to service communication, I have to understand the uh, API that's exposed by each of these services. Whereas if I'm just writing to Kafka topics, then it's all one way of doing things. Now, of course, there still might be the schema of the messages and all that kind of stuff, but um, it does simplify uh, the design a little bit as well. Uh, mostly I want to talk about these streaming engines on the right, but before I do that, I'll just finish the diagram. Uh, all of these things are basically open source components, right? So they all use open standards or easily accessible APIs, so I can bring my own storage options. You know, I can use S3 if I like that. I can use the Hadoop file system. I can use you know, Elasticsearch or regular databases. You know, it all just works, more or less. Although some of these are not as good at stream processing as others. You know, uh, SQL databases typically are not that well designed for you know, just continuous writes, per se, in the same way that, say, um, uh, like a file system might be. And then also, it's completely arbitrary which uh, deployment environment you use, whether you deploy in a cloud environment, whether you're using Kubernetes or Mesos. You could even do this on, on, on the Hadoop Yarn environment, although I'll argue later that it's not really a very good one for this purpose. All right, so let me come back to the streaming engines and talk about, um, well, what I want to talk about is if you were deciding which one to pick, what would the criteria be that you would use for a particular problem? Uh, so for example, someone wrote this really great blog post about a year ago, maybe two now, uh, where they listed all of the uh, projects on the Apache project that are, they call themselves a streaming engine, and there was like a dozen of them, 12 or so engines. Uh, so how do you, how, how do you choose? Um, you may have heard of this idea of the paradox of choice. It's this psychological term where you walk into an electronics store to buy a new refrigerator, and there's like 30 or 40 choices. And so you, you don't want to spend hundreds of dollars on the wrong choice, so you're paralyzed. You, you don't know what to buy, so you end up not buying anything rather than make the wrong choice. So the, the challenge is how do you pick which, ones, uh, which choice to make? So what I want to start with is the criteria with that you could use to evaluate these choices. And then I want to talk about four engines, that, or actually five really, that we particularly like uh, for various reasons that I'll get into. So things you might consider, uh, maybe the biggest one is what is my latency budget? And that could be uh, everything from like picoseconds to microseconds if you're doing true real time, like landing you know, rockets on barges in the middle of the ocean where uh, you really have to get everything out of, out of the way to make sure you can respond quickly. Now, most of us aren't building systems like this today uh, with these kind of requirements, but um, if you were, and if, if, for example, if you were doing uh, high-frequency trading or building true real-time systems, you'd probably be using custom hardware. You'd be using various hacks like so-called kernel bypass networking where the kernel goes directly into user, or sorry, the network uh, stack goes directly into user space and bypasses the layers of the kernel. Uh, obviously, uh, C++ is popular in this crowd, or C itself. But you want to, the main challenge is just get stuff out of the way, and stuff like the JVM garbage collector is typically one of the things you would remove here. But then when you start getting up into a budget of, let's say, I need to respond in hundreds of microseconds, which is more typical for trading, or for, for devices like uh, medical imaging devices, like ultrasound machines, uh, th then you have more options. Uh, so there's actually some really good JVM tools that can do this that have been optimized to eliminate like blocking uh, garbage collection pauses, like the uh, Aka Actors can, can do this for you. Uh, how many of you have heard of the LMAX Disruptor project? Yeah, so that came out of the London Finance community, which is a really high performance uh, queue. Then if you get into, say, tens of milliseconds, the reason I have a picture of credit cards here is I, I had a conversation with someone at, I think it was Deutsche Bank once, who said that if you think about, uh, you're on a website, you decide to buy something, so you click purchase, and you expect to get an answer within a few hundred milliseconds. You know, that's the rule of thumb for usability, that you, within a few hundred milliseconds, something should come back and say, you know, I'm processing this or, or approved or whatever. Well, he told me they only get like 10 milliseconds to actually authorize the purchase of the card. 
all the overhead, you know, including the internet traffic, uh, for that 200 milliseconds, they only end up with 10 milliseconds that they get to make a decision. So that's their latency budget for, for authorizing a, a, a credit card transaction. And we're starting to get into the realm where some of the big data tools can actually meet this requirement, but you have to be careful which ones you pick. So there's this new, uh, relatively new streaming engine called Flink that can handle uh, latencies at this level. And then uh, Akka has always been able to do this. And also there's a wrapper around Kafka called Kafka Streams. Now the Kafka, th this is an interesting one though, because if you think about anything that's going through a message queue, you're imposing a latency budget right there just by the traversal of uh, going through the queue. So if you want to get down to you know, tens of milliseconds, you really have to be very careful with how you use Kafka as well. Not that it's slow in any sense, but just because you are traversing data through a message queue. And then when you start to get up into longer latencies, like hundreds of milliseconds, and here I just threw in a bunch of uh, images of things like I'm working in a notebook environment, so it's, I'm back to that user experience kind of latency requirements. Or I'm doing machine learning where maybe I don't necessarily need really low latency, but I need to do some things with in less than a second. Um, then it often becomes useful to actually switch from individual stream processing to micro batch processing because you get slight economies of scale. You know, if I'm doing 100 things at once, then all the overhead for doing those 100 things is amortized over that 100 rather than the overhead for doing one at a time. Uh, this is actually the, the uh, uh, way Spark was implemented originally, uh, but that was for other reasons that I'll come back to. And then finally, once you start getting up into uh, seconds to minutes, then you're at the, the realm of mixing things like, maybe I want to train machine learning models as data comes in, sort of like my search index example, but I don't necessarily need to be up to the second accurate. You know, it's okay to be a few minutes out of date or even a few hours. So you start to get into these mixed modes of, I might be doing model updating uh, sort of offline, but still fairly quickly, and then somehow bringing those models back over into my stream processor so that I can keep scoring data with relatively up-to-date models, but not you know, up to the second accurate. Also things like extract, transform, and load, where it's really a, a big process of moving data between data systems. Usually I don't have very tight constraints for that. And I actually think that once you get to the point of doing minutes, it's actually better if you just run periodic batch jobs. And the reason being that as soon as you start doing a stream processor, now you have to have something that can withstand network outages, hard drive failures, spikes in traffic, uh, you know, being able to scale up and down dynamically, something that might run for months, let's say. But if I'm just restarting the job every few minutes, then it can just come up with you know, right-sized for the data at, at that moment. You know, it'll run for a, a few minutes, let's say, and then go away. So it's actually a lot easier to keep it robust and healthy if I just restart everything every few minutes rather than try to keep something healthy that's running for long periods of time. Okay, so that's uh, latency. The other one might be, what's your volume? You know, how much data are you ingesting? Are you bringing in like the Twitter fire hose or much smaller things? Uh, we're used to writing services like this where we might take you know, 10,000 events per second or something, and it's not too difficult to write RESTful services that can handle this kind of load. We just have to you know, be somewhat careful about it. And typically we think of these, uh, so I've sort of alluded to something that maybe I should define a little bit. Uh, there's, there's often like events that I want to observe or messages. So the difference between a message and event being a message has usually a sender and receiver, whereas an event is just something that happened. Uh, so I might have a message that says that some event happened, for example. But I think of events or messages as being something with an identity that I want to handle uniquely, whereas a, a record might be, I just have this stream of data, it's relatively anonymous and I can sort of process it in bulk even if I do it one at a time for speed, it's sort of, I can think of it as something I process in bulk. You can even take rest up to, you know, hundreds of thousands of events per second, depending on how well you scale it and if you avoid blocking and that kind of stuff. Uh, when you get up into millions of events per second, then you often get to the case where in order to do this reliably, I need to immediately partition the data and then process it in parallel. And that's where tools like Flink and Spark come in handy. Now, the reason I have a picture of a Nest thermostat here is because of a story I was told by an engineer 
at Nest once that um, it turns out most people get up at about the same time every day. Yeah, and so they would, for every time zone, they would see these massive spikes of traffic as all of these thermostats you know, went from nighttime mode to daytime mode. And they had to do all kinds of tricks to like, put in jitter and, and you know, to somehow you know, spread out that load of traffic so they didn't slam their servers you know, at every morning, 6 a.m. Uh, in every time zone. But they also had to be able to handle those kind of extreme swings in, in the amount of traffic they were handling. The next question is, what kind of processing are you doing? So it turns out, and this is really kind of a weird thing, actually, that's happened in the streaming world. Um, SQL is still emerging as the sort of go-to scripting language for streaming, just in the same way it did for batch. So you might think, if I'm doing stream processing, why would I ever do it with SQL? But it turns out SQL is a really nice, compact way of saying a lot of the things that you need to do. Like, I need to join these two data sets. I need to group over this time window. I need to filter, I need to do like a select or a where clause. Um, there was a, a pretty popular talk at the Flink Forward a couple of months ago where Alibaba in China said that they are converting all of their, uh, you know, they have like thousands of developers who are using Flink and they're gonna convert all of those people to actually just writing SQL to express their Flink jobs. Um, now, how is that going to work? Well, the only way it would work is if you have a way of using user-defined functions that you can plug in custom behavior like, you know, call out to my machine learning library or whatever. But nevertheless, SQL remains popular really for two reasons. One is it's something a lot of people can learn uh, even if they're not really developers. And two, it is extremely concise. So if you can express your problem as a SQL query, then it's actually a really good way to work. Even though most of us who are in this room probably, you know, kind of squirm when we have to work with SQL because it, it feels like we're constrained, right? We want to we want to flat map that shit, as they say, right? So, uh, you know, we don't want to have to <laughs> use a SQL query. But, you know, for a lot of people that works pretty well. Now, this example actually is just sort of a made-up example where I'm using the API version of SQL for Spark, but I could have written this as a SQL query in Spark even. Um, yeah, was there a question? Hey, Dan. Yeah. Um, when you use SQL for streaming jobs, what, what happens if you try to express something that can't be done in a certain setting? So like, for example, if you're using a, something that, uh, a field that's not your data. Yeah, so let me uh, repeat the question for the uh, recording. So Daniel asked, the, 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 the obvious question is, normally when you think of SQL, I'm just paraphrasing the question, you, you think you have all of the data. Like if I'm gonna do a group by or a join, I kind of assume I have all the data. But in a streaming world, that's not the case, right? The data is gonna be coming in continuously. So what does it mean to do a group by or a, or a, uh, or a join? Uh, usually what it means is that you have to add some construct like windowing, where over this time window, I'm going to do a join of what data I have versus maybe I'm joining against reference data or something. And I, was, am I getting to the essence of your question, or were you thinking of something? Uh, no, but that must be the answer to it, right? Okay. Yeah, so if you look at what people, the kind of SQL extensions people are adding when they add SQL to a streaming engine, they usually almost always have these very sophisticated windowing constructs. And I'll actually come back to that in, in just a minute when I talk about a, an engine called Beam. But just to complete this section of analytics, so some things are just basic, like extract, transform, and load. A really good use of Kafka streams, for example, which as we'll get to is, is a nice tool for reading and writing Kafka topics and doing some transformation. You know, suppose I'm just ingesting raw strings for log data and I want to parse them into a nice record format so that downstream analytics don't have to do the parsing themselves. It's a really good use for um, uh, uh, Kafka streams and it's, a, it's, a, it's an example of extract, transform, and load. But then we're back, you know, I had to get some Scala in here, so our favorite thing is that we could actually do data flow. Now this is actually, it turns out, a batch program. It's part of the inverted index implementation. And I won't go into details. I'll, I've already posted the slides, and I'll show you a link at the end um, with a link to a discussion of this algorithm. But, uh, I mean, we all love this kind of code, right, where we can just, you know, sequence together, you know, uh, one transformation after another. Uh, to do you know, whatever it is we need to do with data. And actually, one of the powerful things about Spark, not only did it really show the beauty of the uh, you know, sort of functional collections uh, and how concise they are and how easy it is to express things, 
But also this code below really the second line could just easily be dropped into one of their streaming jobs as well. So you get this kind of global reuse that's possible as well as um, not only the, the usual way of reusing libraries for practical reasons, but thinking. You know, you can think about the, the core problem of what it is I'm doing and then just, you know, use it in a streaming or batch context. And of course today a lot of people are doing things like machine learning where they're uh, like scoring data as it, oops, as it goes by. Uh, and then I, I alluded this problem earlier. This is actually emerging as a really uh, big challenge for organizations deploying streaming. How am I going to train uh, let's say every 10 minutes, and then take that model and move it into my streaming pipeline. It's actually not a trivial problem, especially if I use different tools for training. Like suppose I want to use TensorFlow to update uh, you know, my uh, neural networks, but then somehow be able to score data in my Flink pipeline from there. How do I do that? Uh, I, I got to this earlier, so I'll, I'll skip over this slide. Uh, but the last one is uh, the, the sort of pragmatic consideration of is it actually, uh, Am I working with so much data and so resource constrained that I should really do things in bulk so I get uh, economies of scale? Or do I really have to do things individually because each event needs to be handled in a special way, like complex event processing? Okay, so let's go back and, um, uh, oh, there, actually there's one more point before I discuss the streaming engines. Another pragmatic concern is how do I actually want to deploy this stuff? It turns out that some of these engines, you start up a, a services across your cluster, and then you submit work to them, and they figure out how to break it down into tasks. Whereas other things are actually libraries you embed in your applications, and then you have to figure out all those details about how you're going to run them, how you're going to partition your data if necessary, and that kind of stuff. And the last one is, what do I need to integrate with? Uh, so it turns out Kafka Streams, as I said, only talks to Kafka topics. So that's a bit of a limiting factor, but it's, it's not trying to do more than that. It just really wants to focus on Kafka. But if you need to talk to a whole bunch of other systems, then you might need to use another toolkit that has better connectivity to databases, file systems, and so forth. Okay, so I, I um, thinking about this for a couple of years, I focused on five streaming engines, and actually four of them are sort of what you would use in production, and one of them is kind of like the uh, an inspiration for the others. So let's talk about those and how they meet these uh, criteria. So they were on the right-hand side of the diagram. So uh, the first one is a really interesting project uh, called Google Dataflow that they actually open sourced as Apache Beam. And as you can imagine, Google's been thinking about streaming for a long time. And what's really great about Beam is they have thought through a lot of very sophisticated scenarios, sort of like we got into a second ago with SQL, like uh, you know, how do I actually do something non-trivial over a stream of data when I don't have all the data and I never will because it'll always keep coming? What's interesting about Beam is they, they actually open source the top part, which is the stream definition, the data flow part, and then you provide a runner, unless you're running in Google Cloud, uh, that, that actually uh, materializes that uh, stream flow into something that's running. And it turns out Flink is right now the most mature runner. Uh, option. Um, I think of Beam as sort of the small talk of the big data world, and I put it that way because those of you, how many of you actually know what small talk is? Okay, mostly, okay you probably all heard of it. Uh, so the thing about small talk, when it was popular in the 70s and 80s, everybody talked about small talk. Everybody was influenced by small talk, but hardly anybody actually used it, right? <laughs> they, they were all, all stuck using C++ or later Java. Well, I think um, in a lot of ways, Beam might turn out to be the same, where it's it, not that many people are using it yet, and I don't know if that'll change, but it is influencing what everybody else is doing, because it, they are doing a good job articulating what you have to worry about when you're doing stream processing. So just to give you an example, like let's suppose that, and, and what we're talking about actually to be clear is I don't want approximate calculations. I actually want to do calculations on my stream that are good enough to use for accounting. You know, I could send these to my accountants and you know, file taxes and all that stuff with this data that I've been doing on a streaming context. So let's suppose for the sake of argument that I wanted to calculate every minute, you know, how many items did I sell in each of my stores? You know, let's say I'm Walmart or Amazon. Well, Amazon is one store, I guess, but anyway. Um, the problem is, we all know that networks have you know, finite speed because the speed of light is actually pretty slow uh, for networking purposes. 
And what's worse is that we get partitions in our networks periodically, so the data may not just show up microseconds late, it might show up hours late. So if I'm doing this calculation every minute, I, it's naive to say, all right, the minute boundary just uh, passed, I'm just going to calculate what I've got. Really, I have to stop and say, wait, do I actually know I have all the data? And if I don't have all the data, when do I decide it's OK to do this calculation and just forget about what data hasn't come yet? Or maybe I'll say, I'm going to do the calculation, but I need a mechanism where I can send an update later, a correction, or a you know, basically take back the answer I gave and give you a new one. So these are the kinds of things they've thought about a lot. Uh, the, this particular slide, the, the speaker notes have links to a couple of really good talks by some of the Google engineers that talk about all of these specifics. So if you're interested in stream processing, it's actually really useful to learn what they've done to think about these problems, because inevitably you'll run into them. And that's why Beam is really important. It helps us to think about these kind of more sophisticated scenarios that we run into. Um, but as I said, it's, it's not really used in production that much. So the ones that we like for production is, uh, first of all, Apache Flink, which can run Beam data flows. Uh, how many of you actually use Flink? A few of you, maybe? How many of you have at least heard of Flink? OK, it's, it's actually probably better known in Europe because it, it came out of um, uh, one of the universities in Berlin. What's nice about Flink versus Spark, is, uh, which is better known, is that Flink is designed as a streaming engine for low latency processing, but they're also more uh, ahead of the game in terms of implementing these sophisticated scenarios. So if you really are doing these more advanced uh, constructs in your stream processing, Flink is a really nice tool for that. Uh, Another one is uh, Aka Streams that we really like. Now, you can imagine we really like Aka Streams because I work for Lightbend and you know, I've got to flog my own stuff, right? Um, but actually, what, what's, what's cool about Aka Streams is it, it goes back to that other picture where well, I didn't really say this, but Flink, you basically deploy services and then you submit your job and these services figure out how to break up your job into tasks. Whereas with Aka Streams, you're embedding this library in your code, and so you can organize it and run it any way you want. But you get the full uh, flexibility of Aka under the hood. <coughs> Excuse me. What it gives you is a, um, a domain-specific language for describing a data flow without having to write low-level actors. But you can do things like event processing. It's very efficient per event. This is, uh, again, if, if I have to do everything on an individual event basis, I'd like that to be very fast. Whereas uh, Spark and Flink really are, are poor if I have to do uh, low, low amounts of data because they have enough overhead that I really don't want to do that. They, they, they come into their own at larger volumes of data. So that's why I have mid-volume here. Uh, Aka Streams does not know how to partition your data over a cluster if you're ingesting like the Twitter firehose but it is very good at giving you the tools to do that yourself if you want. Uh, Kafka Streams and Aka Streams kind of play off each other a little bit. Kafka Streams does a really good job thinking about life in Kafka. So what do I want to do with Kafka? Typically, I want to do transformations of records and then write them back to another topic. Or I might want to do aggregations, like just show me the last value for a given key, or give me an aggregate per minute uh, over this uh, set of keys. And they've built in a lot of nice abstractions for this, uh, as well as they've actually recently added a SQL API, which everybody has to have, apparently. Except Akka. Akka's the only one in this list that doesn't actually have a SQL API. So uh, we're keeping it real, I guess. They also claim exactly once. And anyone who's you know, a computer scientist knows that that's bollocks. Or you, you, it's impossible to do exactly once in the uh, arbitrary case. And what, what they've really done with exactly once is they do uh, at least one signaling, you know, message transfer, and then they do deduplication themselves. But you can still concoct scenarios where you'll lose data if you try hard enough. But nevertheless, at an API level, at an abstraction level, it's a really nice uh, abstraction in the sense that you can kind of forget about deduping yourself or you know, dealing with that kind of stuff. They'll handle a lot of the details for you. Now, Spark is an interesting case because Spark started as a batch mode system, and they came up with a really clever hack to do streaming, which is, well, what if we just capture data in time windows and then just run a batch job? 
Uh, and those time windows can be as low as a few hundred milliseconds. Uh, 500 milliseconds is sort of the usual rule of thumb. So what that means is, if you really need to do like those 10 millisecond credit card authorizations, you're not going to use Spark for this. Instead, you'll uh, use Spark to do things like that tr uh, training of machine learning models or that you know, very large scale uh, extract, transform, and load stuff that you need to do. But they are working on a true streaming engine. Uh, they have, a, in fact, a totally new API for streaming, but it's kind of early days for this. And the, the actual true streaming probably won't come until next year. Now, there is one nice thing, though, just in passing. If anyone is still using the Lambda architecture, and it's kind of going away as somewhat uh, obsolete, but it, as I mentioned earlier, once you have so, a source code in Spark, it's pretty easy to take it between batch and streaming if you like doing Lambda. Uh, I, I won't go into the slide. I assume most people here know what uh, the Lambda architecture is. But I, I want to finish with some observations uh, going back to something I alluded to earlier, which is a convergence that's happening in these architectures between microservices and fast data. This is really, uh, this picture, I love this picture. This is a lake in uh, the Sierras in California, and for some reason these rocks look like they're, you know, sliced beef or something. So the question is, how does something like this, with all these sort of big looking services, resemble something like this? I made up this example of, of a <clears throat> microservice architecture where I'm mean, like doing order processing and I have little microservices that each do one thing and each have their own storage. You know, the usual way you're supposed to, at least in theory, write microservices. Well, if you think about the developer experience, they're very similar in a couple of ways. One is that typically when you do a data processing job, you're focused on one responsibility. Like I wanna do this ETL process to move data from A to B, or I wanna do yesterday's uh, calculations for uh, accounting. And similarly, when I write microservices, they're supposed to be you know, doing one thing and not doing a lot of things. Um, and they both also have this problem of they can never stop accepting requests for processing. The data will never stop unless you go out of business or something catastrophic like that, right? So they have all of these requirements. We call them reactive, right? Light bend, you know, availability, responsiveness, um, resilience, and scalability. If you start something running for, hour, uh, for months as opposed to just a batch job that runs for hours, you're going to run into every possible contingency and therefore you have to be able to handle these kind of uh, constraints. So it's kind of forcing your data jobs to look like uh, traditional microservice jobs. The other thing that's happening too is uh, sort of going the other direction. If you start as a small organization, you probably tend to focus on you know, writing CRUD apps or three-tier web apps or whatever. But as your organization grows and you acquire more customers, then data becomes just a dominant problem in your design. If you look at Twitter today, you know, Twitter started out as a three-tier Ruby on Rails application, which is why we got the fail whales all the time, right? Uh, and they had this so-called Justin Bieber problem, um, where every time Justin Bieber tweeted, they had to send out a notification to millions of people that, that for whatever bizarre reason, cared what Justin Bieber had to say. Um, but it, you know, it, it really taxed their infrastructure, and it kind of forced them to, you know, to, for, to change into more of a microservice architecture, but also most of their data, or their data infrastructure looks like giant pipes of data just flowing through this system. So it kind of forces you to change. So I, I think what's happening, just to have like a, a Venn diagram to cover all possible uh, diagram types, um, you have to start, you know, the way things used to look is uh, the, the kind of things that you would obsess about as a developer, there was some overlap if you were writing microservices versus you know, Hadoop kind of stuff, but there wasn't a whole lot. You tended to have different worries. But today, they look a lot more of the same because you, you're basically solving the same problems, just maybe with slightly different tools. But you know, where does Scala fit in all this to come back to, uh, to Scala? Yeah, the reason Scala uh, sort of got a big bump recently in popularity was because Spark is written in Scala, and the uh, Spark uh, Scala API is one of the, you know, it's not really purely monadic and doesn't really follow all the rules of category theory. I'm sorry about that. But uh, it's not my fault. But anyway, but it is really a nice API. It's really easy to use. It's very accessible to people. And it seduced a lot of Java developers to finally switch to Scala. And Kafka is also written in Scala, and some of the other tools are as well. So 
Scala is just this incredible enabler for these non-trivial services to be still reasonably concise and expressive to express some sophisticated data constructs without having to write a lot of boilerplate. So it's, it's been a, a real enabler for, um, for the data world as well as the microservice world. Okay, so just uh, one marketing slide. So we've been thinking about this for a while, so we built this platform that's a, a commercial distribution of this stuff. You can tell it's a commercial product because this picture's in color and the other was black and white. Um, but, but basically I talked about these pieces circled in red and as, as you normally do with a commercial product, people need to be able to run this stuff, so we've added you know, proprietary tooling for management and monitoring. And actually, we made the choice to use Mesos as the runtime because it, it, Mesos is kind of like a second generation scheduling system that can handle almost anything you throw at it, whereas uh, Hadoop Yarn is very limited in the kinds of things it can manage. So we actually like Mesos, but anyway, to wrap up, uh, this is off the Pacific Coast in California, or actually Washington State. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about this, so I, I, th there's a lot more detail in this book I wrote last year, and this is, you know, it's like a little thin 60-page report. And uh, my colleague, Jonas Bonaire, wrote a pretty nice, uh, you know, sort of overview of his view of, of how microservices should work. And I'll have these links on the last slide. But, um, so anyway, thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Is that, all right, any, any questions? Oh, yes, over here. Okay, so the question was, I mentioned in passing some alternatives to Kafka that are emerging. Um, the main one that I'm really very interested in looking at is a project that came out of Dell EMC called Pravega, and that's spelled P-R-A-V-E-G-A, -E and it's, uh, it's, it's a word from uh, one, like Sanskrit or something. I forget what it means. What, what Pravega has done is they've thought about more fine-grained uh, uh, sort of topic management. So, so Kafka is really great if you have relatively static volumes, but very high volumes of data. Uh, but if you have smaller microservices where the amount of data could be going way up and down, it's actually hard to scale Kafka topics uh, that way. So what you do in Kafka is you, you basically partition the data, and really partitions are actually the, the unit of where all the guarantees are applied, like uh, you know, ordering and uh, this exactly once. It's re really topics are, more like a group concept, and partitions are actually the things you care about. So what Pravega has done is, th they use a term called segments that are sort of like partitions, but what's happening underneath your topics in Pr Pravega is it's dynamically sizing and parallelizing these topics internally with these so-called segments, and it's doing all that for you rather than having you uh, to do it yourself. So I actually think, they're, they're smart in the sense that they are competing with Kafka in, in one sense, but on the other hand, they're attacking problems where Kafka is weak, like this relatively small, more dynamic uh, you know, volume size problem. Uh, so I, that's why I'm, I'm very interested in Pravega. And not, not that we're doing anything with it yet, but we're definitely thinking about it. Uh, there are some others. Actually, another one to look at is um, there's a company called Streamlio, and it's a weird name. It's Stream L I O, and it's it's guys that came mostly came out of Twitter. Twitter rewrote Storm, which some of you may have heard of, and, and, and they called it Heron. Uh, Heron being a bird, right? Of course. And th these are some really really good distributed engineers, and they also wrote uh, something called Apache Distributed Log, which is kind of similar to Pravega in the way that it organizes um, topics and manages uh, data under the hood. So that's Apache Distributed Log is another one I'd look at, and what the Streamlio guys are doing around Heron is also, I think, really interesting. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, do you think there's still a role for a traditional uh, message broker in today's uh, Yeah, so the question was, is there still a role for traditional message brokers? Nope, no role at all. No, I'm kidding. <laughs>
No, actually, I kind of got to, alluded to a point here where Kafka might be overkill for what a lot of people need. And so there is, I think, still a role for message brokers, especially at smaller volumes. There's actually an important difference between how most message brokers work and Kafka that I didn't get into, but I'll just mention quickly. Most message brokers function as a true queue, where if you read the event, you pop it off the queue. What Kafka does instead is it keeps track of where you are in the queue, and it, it manages the life cycle of the data. The advantage for Kafka doing this uh, is that I could have lots of different consumers that have different needs, but, all, but they want to see all of the data. Whereas if, if I'm using a regular message queue where each consumer would be consuming events, then it would be impossible for everybody to see the whole thing, unless I was doing other tricks. So Kafka is nicer in that way, uh, just from the design point of view. But at the same time, as I said, it may not be the right choice for more fine-grained purposes. And that's where I think message queues, which are obviously very mature and sophisticated themselves, I think they still have a place. Maybe one more question. Yeah, Daniel. Yeah, so for the record, uh, Daniel brought up the interesting point that because Kafka is persisting the data and it's holding it as opposed to it being consumed immediately, if your consumer goes down and loses its state, you can just go back and pick up where you left off and reread the, the, that topic. So it has that, that benefit as well. Okay, thank you very much.